Hello and welcome everybody to a new series here on the Fisher and Fever channel. Um, I know a lot of you are used to seeing the Saturday Night Fever. We are starting up the Saltwater Saturdays. And what this series is designed to do is go from a freshwater perspective and kind of simplify things, um, maybe debunk some things, make it a little bit easier to transition from freshwater into saltwater if you've never done saltwater before. And you know, we've got people like uh, Mike from the Fish Tank Barn is here with us. Uh, he's going. He's breeding saltwater fish. And I appreciate you being with us for this series, Mike. Um, not a Mike, problem. Uh, who's had saltwater experience, but not to the extent that Mike has. And then Chattanooga Ed, who's not done saltwater. So we're kind of got the whole round table from never done it to <clears throat> what I would call expert level with Mike. And then me somewhere in the middle, just kind of mediating that. Um, but I hope you all enjoy this. It's going to be fun. We're going to try to make it as easy as possible to get you going on a saltwater tank, or at least give you some knowledge. Uh, now, this is not designed to get you going and buying a tank tomorrow. This is designed to get you researching, to get you thinking, to get you trying to figure out what to do to get into saltwater. Uh, because uh, one thing that you'll hear us preach constantly, the most important thing with saltwater is patience, even more so than with freshwater. So that being said, today we're going to be discussing tank sizes, uh, some recommendations from us on what not to start out with, uh, what fish are good for different tank sizes and what you should be researching and setting those tanks up. Uh, this is partially geared towards, you know, maybe I've got a 55 gallon tank that either it's not up and running or I'm kind of just done with what I've got in it. And I want to try something new. Maybe I want to do salt water. Uh, so we'll, we want to get your mind going, get you kind of thinking and researching um, into the salt water aspect of things. So I appreciate all of you being here. Uh, Stephen Hubbard, I see you. We will definitely get to the Super Chats and, of course, the questions. If you have questions or comments, feel free to put those in the chat. Uh, put at Fish Room Fever, and it will highlight for me. I'll be happy to get to those shortly. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and dive right in here. And I think about the easiest way to do it is kind of get some categories of tank sizes, and we can discuss what our recommendations are, um, whether that's a good tank size for a beginner, and if it is, you know, what fish we might recommend to go in that tank uh, and what the thought process is, depending upon what you're looking for. You may just be somebody, and this happened a lot after the Finding Nemo movies, uh, that just said, oh, I want some Nemos. You know, I want some clownfish. Well, we want to get you researching in the right direction and kind of narrow down what you have to sift through to be able to get that started. So, Mike, if, I, if I'm brand new to to salt water never done salt water i'm contemplating it um and i've got maybe a couple different tank sizes that i could use to set that up so i've got you know my, my 10 and unders um what are your thoughts for <laughs> you guys... sorry I'm... no you're good I, you're good it's I'm, I'm uh doing i'm multitasking <laughs> hey that's that's the life of a parent right um yeah, you lost the eyes on it somehow and oh it's on backwards i think hold on we're having wardrobe malfunctions with the clownfish there. Oh, you're good. So in, in my experience, um, my personal recommendation is if you've got a 10 gallon and under and you've never done saltwater, I really don't recommend starting there just because I feel like it's, it's almost setting yourself up for failure. Uh, unless you're a very, very, very uh, meticulous detail oriented person. Uh, maybe if you're like a, a master aquatic horticulturist um, and you've got lots of experience with the high tech planted tanks, um, you might have you might already be in the mindset of succeeding in a small tank, but it's just so easy to crash those things. Um, in my oh, experience. Yeah. Honestly, I would do the biggest tank you can afford. I know we were talking before the show started and that was 75 gallon it was kind of where I started. Absolutely. But literally the biggest tank you can afford because it, it's a lot harder to crash a bigger tank than it is a smaller tank. Definitely. Um, and, and so what we're talking about when we mentioned crashing them is um, your salt levels and other various levels in there. Um, think of it in terms of if I have this cup and I put an ounce of, we'll just say salt in there. 
that's going to be very noticeable in my drink that I've got salt in there. Uh, if I have a one gallon jug of water and I put an ounce of salt in there, it's not going or a tablespoon, I guess it's not going to be nearly as noticeable and so on and so forth. And that's what we're looking at is scale. It's a lot easier to keep things leveled off the bigger the tank. Um, I, I will pose this to you though, in terms of, I think 55s and 40 breeders are fairly common size, um, even more so than the 75s. What would be your your thoughts and recommendations? So I've got a, a 40 breeder lying around, or I've got a, a 55, because a lot of times you can even find 55s off of Craigslist or people are tossing them. Garage sales. Yeah, yeah. garage sales. Well, I mean, um, honestly, like I'd start maybe like with like a small, you know, maybe like a pair of clownfish. You know, remember you you can't stock the same amount of fish, right. so you, you, so it's going to be like a clownfish. You know, four feet long. You, you're not into, into your tangs and things like that. But you know, in the background here, we've got the um, royal grama is a good choice. Mm -hmm. um, you can do like uh, there's little gobies and stuff too, and uh, some of the smaller wrasses as well. You can get into. Yeah, there are definitely some beautiful fish. Um, and I guess we should say there are a lot of people that have nano aquariums in saltwater, uh, the nano reefs, and that's definitely something that you can do. Uh, just keep in mind, if you're looking at doing, like, say, a 20-gallon um, nano tank in saltwater, like Mike said, the fish stocking level on that is not going to be super high. Uh, but you could definitely do a really nice coral tank. Um, and there are so many rabbit holes with salt water that we kind of we touch on and we're going to work through all of them in this series. Um, but it's, it's really easy to go. I mean, just, just mentioning that the 20 gallon nano tank, you could spend an hour on that. The 55, you could spend, you know, a couple hours on talking about that. Uh, but we want to get you researching and chances are there's a tank fit for you. You just need to find it. Um, I know a lot of people. Oops, sorry. Go ahead. I don't know, my favorite saltwater tank is a 180. That's my favorite okay. saltwater tank size. And that is a, an awesome, awesome tank. Um, yeah, I, I was just thinking when I had my 220 set up as a reef tank, and that was an absolutely beautiful setup. Um, but I think there are a lot of people that maybe have some smaller tanks laying around, and they're wondering hmm, what can I do with this? There are definitely a lot of options. And you'll even see uh, like the nano cubes and the, the pre-built setups, if you will, that are, are smaller size stuff. Um, but you really need to spend some time researching before you start setting that up. And again, the big thing is patience. Um, you know, really you want to get it set up and going before you add anything. And at least in, in my experience and in my opinion, uh, give it about six months before you start putting stuff in there versus the freshwater side. You're kind of like, oh, well, I'm going to move a sponge over and have a, a, a pre-cycle tank or, you know, I can get this thing cycled in a week or two. Uh, so that's something I think that I really want to emphasize uh, going back to that patience part. Absolutely. The, the saltwater side of things, you're really considered to have a new tank, new tank for a lot longer uh, on that side. So that's something to know going into it and to kind of look into. Uh, it really relies a lot more heavily on <clears throat> the circle of life, if you will, you know, that that natural balance of all the, the microorganisms and getting everything working like we want to do in our fresh water. But a lot of times we maybe don't get our fresh water set up balanced and we can kind of get by with extra filtration or extra water changes. And you kind of want to avoid that if you will on the saltwater side at least in my opinion uh, you know you want to you want to get the balance there that's the key to the successful saltwater yeah you know, it's almost like that season tank time that you know Corey was talking about i mean that that's really where saltwater is it's and there's a phrase out there that nothing ever, nothing good ever happens fast in a reef tank for example it's one of those things where it's like you piece it together slowly you know, it's not like you go, you know, like say you're buying Neon Tetras, you buy 50 of them. You don't buy 50 green chromis, which is the fish right behind the uh, 
the blue, the, the dory fish, we'll call it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, uh, it's, it's really something you add to piece by piece. And again, that's part of why I mentioned <clears throat> this is not to get you out buying a tank tomorrow. This is no. to get you researching. Um, we want to get you thinking. Uh, and we want to have this series here so you can kind of go back and look at these things. It's, it's hard to find really a lot of, I guess, aquarium reefing for dummies, I guess would be a good way to put it. Uh, a lot of the saltwater stuff is geared towards people that know what they're doing. Um, and I know we have a lot of people here that uh, will never go to the saltwater side of YouTube, so to speak. So we want to kind of bring a little bit of that here and, and talk to you all and share with you all and get your thoughts and maybe find out, you know, what's, what's holding you back if you've considered it. Um, yeah, there's really two places I will tell you to go for the saltwater. If you're, you, if you're just going YouTube, um, one is bulk reef supply. Like they have all kinds of different series on, and, you know, they're, they're kind of, they're selling products, right? So you keep that in right. mind, but there's a lot of great information there. And the other one is someone I learned from and I've, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have someone I actually know now it's uh, Mark Levinson from me loves reef is the other, yeah. is the other one. And like, He's been doing it for years. He's been doing it on the in the forum days, and you know he's got some excellent information as well. So those are both really good places to to kind of start with. And there's a lot of other channels out there as well. You know, like researching anything, get more than one opinion. But that was, uh, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, you just you gotta take it slow, and you really need to decide what you want to do going into it. Absolutely. Um, so I think there, there are two approaches kind of, uh, in terms of researching, you've got the, this is the tank size that I have. So case in point, you know, I have a, a six or well, I'll say 55 because most people don't have a 65. That's a, a kind of an offshoot weird version of the 55. Uh, I have a 55 and I'm kind of done with whatever I've been doing. I'm done with the Tetras or whatever that, you know, I want to do something different or I want to try solves. Um, so then you're going from the approach of, what can I do with the 55? And then you have the other side of it is this is the fish that I want, or this is the, the reef setup that I want. What tank do I need to go with that? And that's very much, uh, it goes hand in hand, or at least it should with the freshwater side. It's something that we should be used to with our freshwater um, fish, you know, in terms of not impulse buying going, Oh, I got this, this little fish. And now I find out it's going to be, you know, 18 inches long or 12 inches long or whatever. Uh, so that's something that you sh should in general be very much used to uh, kind of looking at what fish can go in this size or, Hey, I really want this fish. What do I need to be able to keep it? Um, so really there's not a whole lot of difference in terms of that research aspect going from freshwater to saltwater. And the thing too with saltwater as well is that there's not the outlets that you have to trade fish out. Like you have in, in, in freshwater, like you, you, there's no auction, there's no swap, you know, the fish store probably won't take it back. Honestly, yeah, you know, yeah. that's a, you know, they don't know where it came from. They don't, you know, you know, they don't want to ruin their system. Right. Because if you get something in the system for the store, for example, that's a lot of money. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now we did see something. Ed and I saw something really neat. Um, Ed, do you remember the name of the fish store? It was our buddy John. We visited on our last trip out of town. Um, aquatic art. Was that it? Or arts aquatic? Aquari Aquarium artisans. Was that? Oh, John, I'm sorry. Uh, I've got to. I'll have to look it up. Oh, but geez. basically, I, I, what they had in their uh, for their frag setup or their coral setup um, is they actually would take in surrendered fish. So that was one of the things that. Um, talked about with one of the employees there she's like you know just want to let you know because you, know, you saw like the the blue tangs that had the the hith or the the hole in the head or the head lateral yeah, line if you, look that way, if you look at the purple tank behind my head mm -hmm. that's h l h l l e yep say that uh, yeah it's got it but it came with that unfortunately but but what they had done uh was they they would take surrenders and they went into that system and it kept them away. And I thought that was really, really cool. And that's what she mentioned. She's like, I just wanted you to know, cause you know, uh, um, you're filming, you're all filming it and you're going to do videos. And I wanted to make you aware that these fish are sick fish. People have brought into us and we give them a home in this system. 
Um, mm-hmm. That way people don't look and go, oh, they, they're carrying sick fish. Um, I thought that aquarium. was really cool. It was aquarium artisan. It was aquarium artisan. All right, good deal. Um, I forgot so I thought, all about that. I thought that was awesome. Because like you said, a, a lot cool of things. I've never seen that. Yeah, a lot of places don't do that. Um, and it was it was really, really neat. Uh, but that is definitely something to keep in mind. I'm going to grab a couple of these super chats and questions real quick. We had Stephen Hubbard when we were getting things fired up with that $2 super chat. I don't know that there was anything attached to it. There was not. Just throwing two bucks at us. Thank you very much for that, Stephen. Do very much appreciate it. And we had fit, blah, 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 blah. Fantastic Freaks, our puffer buddy. Let me find that super chat real quick there because I can't see the bottom of it on the other screen. Fantastic Freaks with the $10 super chat it says, so Fish Barn's favorite saltwater size is 180, a. Eh? Okay, what would stock with a porcupine puffer in a 185 bow front tank? Also, any tips to make salt water maintenance as simple as possible? I'm new to salt. Thank you for that, fantastic. And I will turn that over to Mike. Um, um, I am not a salt water. I am not a puffer expert, freshwater or salt water. I would almost put that by itself, honestly. Maybe with like a trigger or something. Mm-hmm. But it's the fish. I'm not really. I've never kept it, so I may not be much help. But I would either keep it by itself or with something, you know, like I like the like the real you know monster saltwater fish, like the triggers and stuff like that. Um, I'm assuming also that's like an eight foot bow for, or not eight foot but six foot bow front. Mm-hmm. Um, maintenance as simple as possible. The number one thing is auto top off. Yes, yes. percent. And uh, Neptune Systems, it's about 150 bucks. But Neptune Systems makes a really good one. Um, it's one that, you know, it, it has um, optical sensors in it. And you don't need to buy the Apex system to go with it. But it's a really good system. It's got, like, triple safeties on it and everything. So it's, it's one that I would highly recommend. Absolutely. Um, that's that's a very important thing the auto top-off is. Um, and w- what you're doing there um, is you're adding in fresh water to that system uh, because your salt doesn't evaporate. So as your water evaporates from your tank, because um, pretty much all of us are used to having to deal with uh, evaporation on the fresh water side. But when you've got a salt water tank, as your water evaporates, your salt content rises, so your salinity level goes up. So you actually want to add for your top offs fresh water back so that you're keeping that salinity level constant because if you keep adding salt in as your top off salt water you're going to keep raising your salinity level up and up and up and up yeah i mean i think there's a few basic things i almost i put that almost as the basic i know people get away with without using that but Mm -hmm. for me that is a a must-have on your system yeah and i i am definitely one of those people that's guilty of not having the auto top offs um, and just manually keeping an eye on it um, and you can do it. You, you definitely can. Is it going to make life easier and make you more likely to succeed with some sort of auto top off? Yes. Um, can you get by without it? If you're looking at like, uh, Ed had mentioned before the show, I want to look at, tell me how to set up this, the setup as cheap as I possibly can. Um, and I think a lot of people are interested in that as well. Um, oh, for sure. Keeping in mind that a lot of times money pays for convenience, uh, I think is a good way to put it. So, no, true. Yeah. Uh, you, you can get by without spending money and it may not be quite as convenient, but it definitely can be done. And that's kind of where I fall into play. Um, I, I'm very much one of those annoying people. It's like, well, I'm not buying that. I can make this thing or I can do this other thing. Um, and, but, you know, I, I enjoy the tinkering aspect in the, the building aspect. If you're somebody that doesn't like to, sorry, I'm trying to get all of this off of my monitor there. If you're somebody that doesn't like to think outside the box and fiddle with stuff, then that's, that's not for you. And, you know, to recommend just buying the thing, so to speak. I kind of compare it to a canister filter. I know how I am. I don't run canister filters. So I'll never, I would never clean it. Right. And so it's, it's kind of the same thing. Like if I just put the, you know, the line on on the sump where where to fit to top it off, I'd never do it. It's out right. of sight, out of mind. That's just I know for me if it's out of sight, it's out of mind, and then you're you're not going to to have it. It's just Absolutely. not going to happen. Absolutely, and I'm very much 
Um, I'm already doing that in terms of like the Zebra Pleco setup that I have. It's run on a sump and it's got a 40 breeder and three tens that are all in that system. And so I'm constantly having to do the top off on that, even though it's fresh water, uh, just to keep that sump level, you know, accurate where it's supposed to be at and keep things topped off. So it's kind of just a part of my routine, if you will. I look and I go, oh, that needs, you know, two gallons of water. Let me do that. Um, but with the salt water side of it, that auto top off is definitely going to help keep things stable, um, which is kind of one of the focuses we're, we're talking about. And it really plays into tank size is the stability, um, being able to keep things in balance, especially if you're looking into coral. So I'm curious, we've got 54 people watching. Uh, let me know if you all are interested in setting up any type of coral tank, or if you're just maybe looking at some pretty saltwater fish, uh, because those are two kind of, different paths, if you will, almost, you know, there are a lot of people that set up just the fish only with live rock, uh, which is what you've got behind Mike there, at least from the, the part of it that I can see. Um, and then you've I got remember when that picture's from, I was trying to find a coral one, but I couldn't find it quick enough, unfortunately. And you also get the, um, you know, I want to do a coral tank. I, I want to have the pretty things growing. Uh, and they really do, and I know you've compared it, and as have I, corals, to me, uh, really go hand in hand if you're used to freshwater tanks uh, with your planted tanks. You've got your really easy, low-tech stuff, um, almost considered like the, the, the duckweed of saltwater, if you will, um, all the way up through what would be like your high-tech planted tank with your CO2 and the expensive lighting and all your different um ferts and things and auto dosers and auto dosers are uh play a huge part in the salt water side of things uh, especially yeah, calcium when get... reactors and dosers and yeah i've always done no i'm not gonna go there uh, that's, that's gonna go way too far <laughs> we will get into those things we'll get but... into that at some point we'll get into like alkalinity and magnesium and stuff but not today <laughs> absolutely and, and this is going to be a I guess an evolving series. Um, keep in mind, this is our, our first of these. So we're kind of feeling things out, if you will. But this is going to be, by the time we're we're done with it, so to speak, by the time we've got it you know, ironed out, it's going to be covering all of the things. And we'll have all this in a playlist where you can go through and you know, watch the specific things that you need to watch. Um, and I, I think Mike uh, is going to do some things on his channel that we can get you linked over to um, him having more knowledge than myself on salt water. So that's going to be fun. And I really think it's going to be an enjoyable journey. And that's really what this is. This is going to be a journey from what the heck is going on and what are we doing and what are we building to, Oh my gosh, look at this amazing salt water tank that we've ended up with. And that's where Chattanooga Ed plays in. So Ed, what are your thoughts as somebody that uh, not does salt water? Uh, what are maybe some of the questions you have? Well, okay, I got one quick question about the puffer fish just now. Mm -hmm. I've had friends that have had uh, one porcupine and one stars and stripes puffer. I think you can uh, get away with different breeds of puffers in the same tank generally with salt water. Have you ever seen that, Mike? Because uh, Fantastic Breeds loves puffers, and it'd be cool, I think, to have two really neat puffers. You know, I, I am not a puffer expert at all. Like, I'm trying to remember if I've seen it like in a store or something. I know I have. I've also, I know that porcupines and dog face puffers get, a, you know, can be in there too together. Yeah. I'd have to actually but, research it. Honestly, because like, that's one that, uh, that I've not really dealt with. Usually like I'll see them and like, don't, I won't even pay them any attention because they're not my thing. You yeah, know, I was always into like butterfly fish or was a thing for me for a lot, for a lot of times for, that, for a long time. And then also like, you know, things like tangs and angelfish and stuff like that. For sure. Well, okay. So since we're doing this series, I am going to commit to making a, at least a beginner saltwater tank. And I was thinking I've got a spare 20 tall. I could also go get a 40, no problem. Or I could go on Craigslist. I don't know if they have, does Craigslist still work? I don't know. Try to find a used large tank somewhere and uh i could try to go big but i don't I'm, i want to try to do mine 
on uh, pennies on the dollar. You know, I'm going to try to go affordable on whatever I do. And uh, I was just thinking about, I just wanted to try to grow a couple of corals and they were like two clownfish. You know, I mean, you could do I, two clownfish in a 20, no problem. Absolutely. Um, then, and then the and corals, maybe a shrimp. Yeah, that's probably, yeah, I think that'd be okay for a 20 for sure. Yeah. It really depends. Like when you say corals, there's types of corals and they have different require, requirements. Excuse me. Can't talk today. And so you really need to know what corals you like. You like, you need to go, go to like live aquaria and go mm -hmm. through the coral section. And, and I did this with my kids for freshwater fish and it was a mistake because I ended up with discus, but take, take the live aquaria section and go through the coral part of it and start looking at what you like. And that, I mean, that's a good way to, to at least start like to know what they are. Gotcha. Absolutely. That's a, a very good way to do it. And generally it's been a while since I've been on there. I'm pulling live aquaria up now, but I feel like they had kind of, an overview when you clicked on a coral, kind of like your fish of like what the requirements yeah, are for that. What kind of what it is. I mean, generally just to kind of start it off, there's basically um, the kinds of corals you have, you have things like are like soft corals that are like your leather corals, mm -hmm. uh, like um, euphilia, which are like your hammered and torch corals. You've got zoanthids, which are their own separate. They're almost little, I don't know what to call them. They're like these little, polyps little button polyps i guess oh yeah okay and then you've got you know your like lps corals which are like your brains and your like lobos and stuff like that and then you've got i know i'm, I'm speaking a foreign language to some people here i understand that and then you've got your like um like your sps which are your um run them small polyp stony coral mm -hmm. and those are like your the stuff that you you visualize it like in a reef right you like your you know, like the Elkhorns and the, you know, the um, Monty, the Monoporas and stuff like that. Well, I'm going to try to dive into this kind of like I dove into plants. Well, no, I'm not. I don't want to go like when I dove into plants, I just bought like one of everything and I saw what would grow and what wouldn't. No, you this, just don't need to. I'm just going to buy a couple of the dirt cheap, easiest ones, the ones that are like the not necessarily the duckweed, but maybe the water sprite of the saltwater world. And it's weird because the water, it's, the thing that I found is that like the, kind of like with people's water too, right? With plants. Mm -hmm. Although it might be with the water sprite for one person is not for yep. the next. Well, and I figured I'd be doing most of my business, well, probably all my business with my local guy, Aquatic Aesthetics. Absolutely. So that way he has an idea of what, our water is right here right now right i mean and i guess the thing too though is if you start getting into coral something i didn't mention is you, you may want to get into doing some rodi as well Absolutely. we didn't, we didn't touch on that and i think we should i mean that's i mean a lot of times you'll hear in the, the freshwater people say like remineralization and that's really what salt water you're doing it's the same right. thing but it's like you know you you do need to want to yeah, so you really do need to get the RODI unit. You know, they're easy to set up. They're, I think, a hundred, couple hundred dollars. I always, you know, find like a food grade barrel or like the Rubbermaid trash bin, and use that, and then keep your store your water in there. You know, so it, but you can also get it from the local fish store. There's another well, that's, option. I was going to say I'm going to play devil's advocate here because I've got an RODI. I've got it. Uh, mounted in the bathroom there to the hook up to the water system. And I, I refuse to use the thing again. Um, I just, uh, I've used it before. I had it when I did the 220 um, and some other saltwater tanks. Um, but I have, oh, I'm not going to pull one down. I have a bunch of barrels up there. Let's see if I can see those, those jugs up there. Yep. And then shipping boxes on top of them. Um, I've, to play devil's advocate, if you will, um, because I know a lot of people here a couple hundred bucks for an RDI, and I think you can get them for like one fifty even nowadays. So they've gotten a lot; uh, they've gotten fairly cheap. Um, you can get one of those jugs, take it into your local fish store, or a couple, depending on size. Again, so I'm looking at something like Ed with his twenty gallon tank. Um, yeah, I, and I, 
and this is hard for me because I always go like go big or go home. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I have no problem getting like a 40. Yeah. No, but it's all that peripheral stuff that will eat you alive, right? Yeah. As we start talking about this, right? You have like the RODI system, right? You've got now, and I actually, what I've done with mine, you know, since I just run um, like just the fish, I just run it through, I took off the RO membrane and I actually just use it, make it like a push filter. Okay. So I push it all. I have two like um, sediment filters and then a carbon block. And then I push the, the water for the clownfish tank through the, um, the DI resin, but I don't do the RO part. Absolutely. <clears throat> so uh, we did have some questions about RODI being necessary. I recommend it. Um, again, I'm, I'm very much going to play the devil's advocate on a lot of this stuff. Um, and, and Mike and I are not going to argue, but I'm, I'm very much going to pick at him with my devil's advocate portion of it. Um, but I will say, I, you I keep me honest. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely recommend the RODI if you've not done saltwater before. That being said, there are some people that are doing amazing, beautiful reef tanks um, with just tap water and mixing the salt in. There's a lot that factors into that, though. Um, things like, you know, what? Oh, goodness. I can't think of the, the one I'm looking for here that causes most of your algaes in salt water. It's been phosphates salt, generally. Phosphates, yes, phosphates. Thank you. Um, there are a lot of things to take into consideration with that. Now, if you're doing, <clears throat> you want to do a fish only tank, let's say, oh, I want to set up a tank for a lionfish. You may not care if you get a bunch of funky colored algaes growing in there um, versus if you've got a really nice or you're wanting a really nice pristine coral tank, reef tank. Uh, you definitely don't want the the funky stuff accumulating in that tank. Um, so again, kind of the the splitting of two paths there. Uh, but I will recommend, even though I have done the tap water um, and mixing salt thing, um, if you're just getting into it specifically, if you're going to be doing corals, and it's not just going to be fish only with live part rock, I would definitely recommend using RODI. Um, you can either do like. Uh, Mike has mentioned, like, I've got the unit, uh, or you can get the jugs, and that's actually what I use, uh, is I just take those to the store. Even though I have a unit, um, you know, the salt is already pre-mixed in there. I can get just RODI, or I can get the pre-mixed salt water from them, um, so I don't have to fool with any mixing or any filtering or anything like that. I just go and buy it. Um, now I've got water in the floor, so I will be right back. I'm going to turn it over to you two gentlemen. Okay. We're back. I have a leak. That's not good. No. I'm uh, writing stuff down as people give me tips. <laughs> yeah. So okay. there's a there were a couple questions in here. I know Terry asked Terry's Tropical Tanks. What TDS are you getting? And I've not checked it. Honestly, so I I should actually get my TDS meter out and check it. But I mean, the fish are do, they're doing okay with it. So I, you know, I mean, honestly, I probably could just run it off of tap water would be fine i mean it's kind of like it all depends on what you want and this is where this kind of comes to is what do you, what do you really want to do you know and uh, i think daniel makes a good point here to start you know start with the soft corals i mean like you know if you start getting into to sps you're starting to get into calcium reactors you know really keep an eye on your magnesium your magnesium your alkalinity you know, calcium levels and stuff like that. So it's really, it's, it's a lot like plants. Awesome. Uh, well, uh, I was planning on doing, and I don't want to do live rock because I don't want as many parasites that a lot of people get. You know, uh, like the, what's it called, a bristle worm? But those are kind of uh, good, though. They're they're like they're like snails and salt and uh, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, I mean, yeah, you you know, you pick your rock up, you did get a little, little tines or whatever. It's not, you know. I thought I would just go with now. What about this type of stuff? Yeah, that that's that's basically like cut up um, coral rock. I have some sitting right here. I haven't put it away yet from the last time we talked, but it's this stuff. 
Yeah. This is this is like I use it in all my saltwater tank or my freshwater tanks too for um it buffers the calcium really well. That's but it, why I have it is just to break pieces off and drop into tanks. Yeah. That's why I've got it for my for my guppies. But uh I my uh, local fish store guy, he has set it up really neat, like a little mountain of these pieces. And I thought I would just do something like that. And then he's just got corals here and there, and they're just kind of growing all over it. And that's, you know, I just want kind of a bouquet, a bouquet on there. Eventually yeah. With, Honestly, and, I think a good place maybe, maybe for you to start with that tank is something like the zoanthids and, like, maybe some soft corals, like leathers and maybe, you know, um, stuff like that. Now, Chevy does make a good point. So if you are buying zoanthids, um, they do have um, they do have the palytoxin. So we weren't really going to be talking about fragging so, so far, but that's definitely one, you know, something to keep in mind is that, you know, if you start cutting zoanthids up, you need to, uh, you know, make sure you, you know, you really – take care not to inhale that stuff or, you know, because it will do very bad things to you. Okay. Good to know. Uh, what? Let's talk. Now, one of the keys to corals is a lighting. Correct. I've, I've got to have, and I just can't put, you know, my normal lights on there. It's got to be a, a higher powered coral light, right? Yeah. I mean, there are some of like, I was looking on Amazon um, kind of poking around a little bit and there, you know, there's like the aqua, the, the aqua need, there's an aqua need, I think like, I don't know how good it is. Um, I would, I would almost do something like a kind of either, either like a current or like a flu ball 3.0, like something like that. that. That's what I was thinking to do the 3.0. I've got, that was my original plant light. And I like how it did the time and everything since I was new to it. I didn't have to keep the times going. Now I'm all on aquanites through this whole fish room because it would just cost me a bajillion dollars to hook up right. you know, flugels everywhere. But uh, I was thinking maybe do, you know, if I'm going to spend the money, I'm going to spend it on the flugel saltwater light and uh, put the timer on and go with the recommended stuff and then maybe play with it eventually later like I did with the other one to get it dialed in perfect. But uh but so do you recommend the Flugel 3.0 salt water? Yeah, that one or another one out there to look at to kind of in a similar price range. It's a it's a more of a puck light, but it's the um the aqua illumination um oh what's it called? Throwing a blank on it. Hold on. I'm gonna have to look it up. While you're looking that up, thank you, Paul Sotero, for the $5 super chat. It says, for the Finding Nemo Fund with four piles of poo on there. Very much appreciated, Paul. Hope you're doing well. We are about to go back up, and I'm going to grab some questions and things out of the chat. Um, and everything is fine. It was actually just where I had used the shop vac um, to tank stuff. There was still some water in the hose, apparently, when it got knocked off there by the cats. So it was just water draining out of the shop vac hose in the floor. But it's the, it's the aqua elimination prime. Okay. Aqua elimination prime. Or yeah. illumination. 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 And it's about, it's about a couple hundred dollars. And it covers like a 24 by 24 area. And then uh, Terry's got a good one, too. I was thinking about that one, too. I don't have experience with the with them but the current usa as well yep. is another one that you can look into i had a, a current back in the day i had the the god awful massive 1400 72 inch current with the metal halides and all that back before leds were um really affordable and kind of the the mainstream and i'm really glad that leds have come to play the role that they have now in the aquarium hobby yeah i remember the days of the metal halides there's yeah. people who still run them though. Well, I mean, they have their uses; they really do. Um, but they're not—they're not cheap to run. And then you've got these massive converter boxes. At least for that setup, you know, I had three bricks like that basically um, on the power supplies, and those things kicked on, and it was just sounding like a generator firing up. 
yeah, I mean, but then you know you can start getting into like Daniel says, like the Kessels. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I like can't that. afford those. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> I don't and, even know how much the salt waters cost, but I know what the fresh fresh. No, water. they're they're up there. Um, if you really want to go, like if if cost was no option, honestly, you'd go like the um, the EcoTech um, Radions. Mm -hmm. They're like eight fifty a piece. Yep. Yeah. And well, maybe at the yeah. end of the year, I could put all my YouTube money together and buy that light. <laughs> buy like one. Yeah. Buy like, like, yeah. It's not. No, it's, it, it's one of those things. Like, <laughs> do you need that light? No. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it depends what you want, right? I and mean, you know, the one thing with salt water, a lot more than with fresh water, it you can go down the the um the huge rabbit hole with gadgets you really can um and that's again i think one of the big big things about preaching the research aspect um really research 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 before you buy things because you may end up going with a 400 dollars light we'll say um and then you turn around after you've already purchased that and go oh well you know i, I wish i had known about this protein skimmer um, and we'll talk more about protein skimmers and those things on upcoming episodes. Um, but this other gadget, you go, well, I could have really gone with the cheaper light um, and put that money towards this instead. Or I could have gone with the cheaper light and, you know, bought this fish instead. Um, so really researching is definitely a key and finding out what's going to fit best for you, uh, your budget, and I guess the level of simplicity that you want to set up. Uh, Kind of again going back to like the auto top off uh, is that going to make your life a lot easier yes um do you have people like myself that haven't spent the money on it that just will do the manual top offs yes so uh, you know you've got both sides of it it's kind of what road do you want to journey down and we're just trying to get the options out there and kind of in front of you so that you're aware of them and you can look into what's going to work best for you and the time that you have available the budget you have available and just the level of convenience that you want to put into it Right. It's, it's one of those things where the one thing I will say uh, with saltwater is that it's a little less forgiving of mer on mistakes, like yes. both on the, wa the wallet and things like that. Definitely. Absolutely. What about, uh, can I use pool sand for a substrate? Um, I would say pro yes and no. You're going to run into something called silicates. Yep. And that just generally would cause you some algae problems. Um, you know, it's one of these things you're, unfortunately, like, you, you kind of have to spend the money on some of the stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> That's, um, I will definitely recommend going with the legitimate sand for salt water, the live sand, uh, as it's referred to. That being said, devil's advocate again, I do have a tank set up right now. My one, uh, 110 is the, was the Fowler tank. Um, I ended up with a mix of pool filter sand and live sand in that. Um, you did have the issues with the algae from the silicates, as Mike mentioned, um, but I'm not really seeing much of that anymore. And I, I've almost debated, I'm still debating whether or not I, I transitioned that sand over into the reef tank I'm setting up or if I just start a new with new live sand. So but I definitely would recommend, uh, especially if you're doing like a 20 gallon, um, just buying that bag of live sand uh, because it's not just the silicates that I'm looking at. I'm also looking at the fact of um, the organisms, you know, all, everything that you've got going in the sand to get that tank up and running um, and almost cycling, if you will. Uh, there, there's more to it than just the simple physical substrate. Well, you never know. Maybe I won't do this if I can't afford it. <laughs> no, like, we're, no, we're, we're, we're getting you down the, like, you know, so, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's just the hard thing, right? It's like, you are going to spend some money to do it right. Right. Can you get away with not spending the money? Absolutely. I've done it. Um, do I necessarily recommend it as the easiest approach to setting up a bulletproof saltwater tank? No. Can you do it? Yes. Um, 
And I know Mike's probably over there cringing, like, what? You used pool filter sand and tap water with salt and, um, you know. Hey, you know what? Whatever works. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you if, can if do it. an emergency, I, yeah. would, I, would hook the, I would hook the garden hose up and we'd go, we'd, we'd go to town. Yeah. Um, again, there are chemical issues that you run into, I guess, the best way, like you mentioned, um, you know, phosphates and then silicates and things of that nature. And you can get some algaes. Uh, I I never minded that in my fish only tanks um, that just had rock. They didn't have corals. It never really bothered me. Um, but it's definitely something if you're looking again to go the coral method, you kind of want to avoid. So again, you know which which rabbit hole do you want to go down? Um, you know right. which which tunnel do you want to dive deeper into? I'm going to go to the chat because we've only got about 15 minutes left. I know we had some questions and comments and stuff. Um, Marianne had asked, will I be sh when will I be shipping fish? Not in the immediate future. I've still got um, some people that had run some giveaways last year that I need to get taken care of. Uh, I've got some things um, for members that I need to get taken care of. We've had a lot of stuff going on around the fish rooms and just with life in general. Because um, life doesn't work out how we planned it, right? Case in point, just today, the AC and the fridge went out. So... Um, that's kind of been how the past six months has just gone. Um, so I'm not going to be shipping out fish in the immediate future, unfortunately, but I am working to get back to that at some point. It'll probably go to the members first um, for dibs on what I've got, so to speak, just because I know that I could more easily um, tend to their needs versus just open market, if you will. Um, but I do very much appreciate you asking. I am working on getting stock levels back up to where they need to be at. Let me go back down through here. Hello, Crystals, Pets, and Plants. I'm grabbing the highlighted stuff as we go through here. Hello, Patrick Hardy. Good to see you as well. Uh, Mike's Aquatics thing says, does the salinity go up uh, too as the water evaporates? Yes. So because the salt does not evaporate out um, as you get evaporation from your tank and that water level gets lower, the solidity level rises. So if you are adding more salt water to your tank to make up for the evaporation, you are increasing the salinity level. And that's why we mentioned you only want to top off with fresh water, no salt, uh, to maintain that constant salinity level. And then, and then one thing too is get a refractometer as well. That's another thing. That yeah, we, that is one thing I will recommend. And they, they've gotten fairly cheap. They used to be expensive, you know, 10 years ago. Um, that was one of those things that a lot of the clubs shared. Like the club would have one that like you could borrow and then bring back because they weren't cheap, um, you know, a decade plus ago, but they've gotten fairly cheap. And also, you get to feel kind of like a scientist with your refractometer. You're over there, like yeah. Basically, what it is is you've got this tube with an, an an eye outlet, if you will, and you hold your eye up to it. And you've got your drop of salt water on there, and you're looking through it, and you're kind of measuring the line. So that's to very very simplify it as dumb as possible. Um, but that's what the refractometer is, and it lets you know the salinity of the water, uh, which kind of like feel like a scientist. Right? Like, hmm, hmm, I'm measuring out fancy science stuff and then uh, the one thing too is make sure you keep it by the calibration fluid oh absolutely yeah because if it's not properly calibrated um which i think that would um do you have a video on refractometers i do and it's not labeled very well it has gotcha. like a mud skipper on it gotcha. and, uh, it's not it should be like i should retitle it i just have it Gotcha. I, I thought I felt like you had one, um, so I would just say, go check out Mike's video on that to learn about refractometers, um, because it is it's an important thing to have. Melvin mentioned uh, crushed coral; it's a, also a possible substrate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. A lot of people are giving me great ideas. Um, it just I'm writing them down, but I'm not saying it. So I appreciate it. Guys. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so we've got uh, Patrick Hardy says those Christmas tree worm, blah, blah, blah. those Christmas tree worm rocks are beautiful. They come in many different colors on one rock. Uh, very colorful. They can go into a small aquariums. Absolutely, Patrick Hardy. Very good point. Uh, and then Chevy Fish was telling you to start with mushrooms, Ed. Oh, I didn't write that one down. I That's did write down. The, yeah. I, I wrote down. So far, I've. 
this is what I've wrote down for different types to look at. Uh, soft corals, Christmas tree, worm rocks, uh, zoanthids, leathers, and now mushrooms. Yeah, and so Chevy brings up another valid point. And this is something we'll definitely get into a little bit further down the wormhole when we get there. Uh, but talking about corals also wage chemical warfare and some have long sweeper tentacles. Yes. Yep. Um, they definitely, and we'll discuss that on an episode, I'm sure, in terms of coral placement and then battling each other and things of that nature. You know, James, uh, Bob really wants to go to Atlanta. There is a shop in Atlanta we haven't taken you to. All they have is corals. It's amazing. Ooh. And maybe if you get a chance this week, we could uh, see if Bob's free this week and we could go to that coral shop. And then maybe we could do like a members only or do something, you know, just a video. You guys pointing out. Well, sorry, Mike, you can't show up. Well, you can come, Mike. But <laughs> what what these different things are for me. And it might be interesting for other people. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that might be interesting. Yeah, Aqua Shell is a good place for that too. Yeah, definitely. Yep, and that's yeah. just a month away. All right, I think. Oh, well, two, three months away, June. So I, know, I know we had a lot of good comments, but I mostly I I grabbed the highlighted stuff, and I'm at the bottom. So if you had something else you wanted us to mention, answer, feel free to throw um, that in there. I'll answer Terry's real quick um, about Ice Cap. Like, I've got to take a look into that, but I did. Did see that question, and then he does have a good about green star polyps and pulsing xenia. I'm writing that uh, down right now. <laughs> now they're bulletproof, but to a lot of people, they're kind of like the duckweed of saltwater. They are. They are. So um, keep that in mind. I, however, am one of those people that, um, and I know Bob Kaler's Aquatics. He's got xenia. Um, I, I've always enjoyed the green star polyps and the xenia. But I also feel like it's a wonderful beginner coral because it's easy to get that sense of accomplishment. So if I'm if you're coming from freshwater and you've never done salt and you've never done corals, um, you know you may not have great luck going straight into like we'll say small polyp stonings or SPSs. Um, whereas you can get something like Xenia or Green Star polyps, and the next thing you know, the stuff is expanding everywhere, and you're you're having success, and it helps to further drive you into that that tank and into that part of the hobby i'm um, gonna go oh, well i'm doing well with this let me research and see what else i could probably do well with and don't be afraid to fail yeah absolutely that's the one thing too i mean you you know it's one thing for us to talk and i, I found this when i started doing salt water was i read all the forums and i read all the stuff and and then all of a sudden it was i started doing it and it was a, it was different when you get your hands wet and get dirty in the mud, per se, than Absolutely. it is reading it and talking about it here. Yeah, no, most definitely. Um, and I think that's, I guess, a, a good way to approach it, any part of the hobby, but especially on the saltwater side, um, because it can be more intimidating. It generally is more intimidating, so people are kind of scared um, to get in there because they're afraid they'll fail. Whereas fresh water, they're not there's not quite that fear of failure, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, but, but you have to, you have to, I mean, you have to go through some learning pains. You do. That's you do. There's, yeah. there's some growing pains that you have to go through with it. Yeah. I mean, you, we went through those and, you know, you go through those on the freshwater side. It's to be expected. You would do so on the saltwater side of things. Um, yeah. A lot of people talk about Zinnia. I love Zinnia. I really do. Um, it, it's, it's really tough and it's one of those that it, multiplies fairly quickly um so it really gives you that um an easy win if you will um it's enjoyable and it's an easy win so you can go hey i'm growing this it's working all right i'm doing well uh, then, i'm sorry go ahead buddy oh then i did find a bottom dwellers aquatics question um if i went salt it would be for an octopus and <laughs> now here's the facts with one things about octopus um one blue ring octopus will kill you so yes. please don't buy those <laughs> um also octopus are extremely intelligent and you'll actually need to basically make them a waterborne prison so that they can't escape because they will escape through the smallest tiniest hole yep. and they will you will find them 
they're a skate artist, even more so than like your jumping fish. So you literally need to make them almost like a locked prison in order really? to keep them in the in their tank. And that sounds crazy, but they they will quite literally get through the smallest hole that you would not think possible. Uh, they also have pretty short lifespans too. Yep. For their cost range is pretty. They do. Quite, we almost bought a jellyfish tank a few years ago. <laughs> I'm glad we didn't. But uh, they only live, they only have like a three-year lifespan, and they have to be collected from the ocean at adults. So you don't know. You're probably getting maybe, you're hoping a year and a half. But right. you might be getting a lot less. Absolutely. Actually, we were in uh, Myrtle Beach last week, and uh, there were quite a few different jellyfish. There was well, there were there, there were one species, but there was quite a few different jellyfish there in terms of numbers they, they'd like beach themselves and so there's a little short video of one on the on the channel if you want to check it out nice yeah I, i'll have to go look at that i think the guy who sells jellyfish tanks like his company is actually where they build them is in myrtle beach <laughs> oh that's funny yeah that's weird i don't know if you'd put these in a tank they were pretty big they were about say oh wow well, yeah uh, wow no he <laughs> had just kind of well, it was in the New York Aqua Experience or Aquatic Experience. So maybe you saw it, that round. It's the round tank, Chrysler like tank that spins like this. Yeah, spin around in circles. Yeah. So I've got two from Crowd to Half Moon. First is: Have you any experiences culturing brine shrimps from eggs to adults? I do not. Um, the only time I've ever done brine shrimp eggs is just to feed the baby brine to other fish. Uh, and then I've got a question here. I'm going to send off to Mike because well, I'll explain why here in a second. But the question is also from Crown Tail. Can you explain the method? How do you mix salt to right salinity? And do you premix and store, et cetera? What brand and water you use? Do you aerate storage tank? And is UV sterilizer good for reef? So the reason I'm going to turn that over to Mike is, uh, as I previously mentioned, I got tired of fooling with mixing the water and that's why I just buy the water from the local fish store. One, I don't mind supporting the local fish store and two, it just makes my life easier. So that kind of goes back to the, do I want to do it the cheaper way or do I just want to do it the convenient way? And it's more convenient for me to go buy 40 gallons of salt water and hang out at the fish store for a little bit and see the fish than it is for me to fool with mixing. But I'll turn it over to Mike. I kind of always did the trial and error method. You know, you get, you know, I, I use Instant Ocean. Mm -hmm. I know there's a ton, there's a ton of different salts out there, but Instant Ocean is like the oldest, you know, most. I mean, I don't I say most recognized, but they, they use it at the Georgia Aquarium and the uh, with the um, the whale shark. But you know, I it's it's also the cheapest one. So, I always I've always used Instant Ocean, but and I've been I've done okay with it. And reef crystals, this pretty is like the the next level up. But yeah, yeah. but I've used. I always have to be able to pull something out of my bag of tricks to show people. Yeah, you, you have like a, <laughs> a you have like a, a whole storefront underneath your desk there. He does. You should see his help gets really tired of running back and forth grabbing products for him. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but yeah, no, it's um, but yeah, I just use that, and I, I kind of just the one thing I did is I bought a fifty-five gallon jug or a 55 gallon barrel. Mm -hmm. So like the bag was a 55, is like a 50 gallon bag almost. Right, so I kind of did the bag along along with the height of the jug, but it's one of those trial and error, make sure you test it. And there's just, you know, there's instructions on the package as well. There are, yeah. So it's, um, and then I've done that. Um, what were the other questions? Sorry, I just kept talking. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, was asking how to mix to right salinity. <clears throat> Do you pre-mix it and store it, etc.? cetera? Uh, you covered the brand. Um, and then in terms of what water you use, you're running an RODI system um, for yours so that you're getting the, the funk out of the tap water, the phosphates and whatnot. And, um, and referencing, do you aerate storage tank? So yeah. I always ran a power head in there. Uh, and when I was pre-mixing and I did always pre-mix, I never mixed it and then immediately dumped it into the tank. Uh, or if I did, it was because, oh my God, something happened and I just need to get the salt water in now. Um, but generally on a pre-mix, I always ran a, a power head in there. I always actually did an air stone. I just kind of put an air stone in there. 
Yeah. I mean, that's one of the benefits of having both Russian salt. Yeah, absolutely. If you have the air stone, you can just toss like the never clog air stone in there. Well, see, and I, I, I feel like that's something I would definitely do now. But at that point, even though I was running fresh, I didn't really do air driven. I was not a fan of air air pumps and all that stuff. Everything was very much hang on back canisters um, and sumps because it was saltwater tanks and monster fish. So it okay. was lots, lots of sumps and lots of canisters, and I really didn't have air pumps. Um, but yeah, that's definitely another way to do it. And that's probably what I would end up doing now. Uh, but it seems like I always had an extra power head. I could just drop in a bucket or a, a container or whatnot. I think we got all the angles to that. Uh, like Chevy fishes, I use a maxi jet to make salt water separately. Yeah, and you can even, um, a lot of them will select the maxi jets. Um, you can even set them up Venturi style. So you've got a, a tube that runs into the top of it and it sucks air in and it pushes it through there. Um, and I would do that. So very much to the airstone aspect of it. But it is 9.02 Eastern time. Uh, it has been a fun show. I do want to say there was one more super chat came out. I think it was when I was away, but fantastic freaks threw a $5 super chat out there on top of the 10 he already threw at us. Just throwing the money at us. Didn't even have a question attached to that one. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate all of you being here. we got 62 people watching. I believe Jeff Rose is going on tonight. Uh, he may already be live. I'm sure uh, Zen will let us know. Thank you, Zen, for posting links to the fish tank bar. I still haven't gotten the V out of there, Mike. I know you took changed to fish tank barn. I, I'm working on that. No worries. Uh, thank you, Zen, for posting the link for fish tank barn channel. Thank you, Zen. Uh, I will put that in the description as well, along with Chattanooga Ed. Thank you for posting those. Uh, I know that it was a little rough on my part, um, but I feel like as we continue to do this, we'll get kind of more into the rhythm of things. It's almost like starting live streaming all over again, if you will, because we're diving into this whole new thing of um, what are we going to talk about? There's 4 million things we haven't discussed and what, what are we going to pick at tonight? So, like where do you start, right? I, yeah. I mean, when you ask, uh, like where I was like, where do you start this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, where is the beginning? <laughs> yeah. So I guess um, in conclusion, from my perspective, uh, kind of intermediate level, I would say, if you've got an extra tank, is there really such thing as an extra tank? I don't know, but if you've got an extra tank, um, yeah, you can transition it over to salt water. Are there going to be some things you need to look into specifically for whatever size you're doing? Yes, um, I'm, I'm really not recommending anything 10 and under if you've never done salt water. Um, 20 and up is really where I would say um, comfortably. If you're new to it, you could definitely dive into that. Research being the key thing, uh, but look at either A, what tank you have and what can go in that tank. A uh, real, real simple thing would be Google, you know, saltwater fish for 20 gallon tank. Um, and you're going to see things like the clownfish we talked about and some gobies and some things like that. It's a really beautiful fish. Uh, or if you're coming from the other end of it, <clears throat> you know, you saw this blue uh, with Dory from Finding Nemo, um, you know, researching the fish that you want or the corals that you've seen and that you like. Uh, like Mike mentioned, go to liveaquaria.com. They've got a wonderful site. Look at those corals. Find out what it is you like. And then find out what your needs are going to be for that. Um, really recommending starting with some of the soft corals like we discussed. Um, but we're trying to make it as simple as possible. And again, I'm playing devil's advocate. You can, you can do things cheaper. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Um, or you could do things easy and it might cost you a little bit more. But that's that's my two cents for the day, and I'll turn it over to Mike for final thoughts. And Ed, yeah, and I guess the one last thing I was thinking of as we were talking here is the a lot of saltwater fish. They're a lot like African cichlids in terms of like the their behaviors and stuff like that. That's kind of it's a very they're a lot like African cichlids. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, uh, sorry. The last part of Crown Tail's question earlier was uh, thoughts on uh, UV. Uh, oh, filtration. yeah. Um, I've really not used it, but it uh, it will, you know, if you get the right flow rate, it will do some things for you for sure, help you keep your water clear. Yeah. So, I, but I, I really haven't played with it. Yeah, I, I had one, and 
I ran mine without it. Um, I think that that's probably one piece of equipment that you could get by without worrying about. Um, so that's that's my two cents on it. I agree. But, oh, well, we've, we've probably left you more confused than, than helped you tonight, and I'm sure we have with most of the people, but this is only number one of a long series, so bear with us. African cichlids, I believe, were originally saltwater, and, they, and uh, that's what they believe, and those lakes just got trapped like they were eventually it rained enough that it got rid of the salt yeah. yeah and but that's i think that's maybe why they they're so similar in many ways and they're they have such vibrant colors and stuff but i mean still thousands of years of transforming to their environment makes them different too but yeah no yeah it's just, it's just a good thing to, to kind of compare it to like yeah oh yeah you know oh, like it, they're they're a lot like they're a lot they're very similar well thanks guys a lot and everybody that gave me great suggestions i tried to write a lot of it down and i'll go back and i'll rewrite the stuff i missed with the camera close to me where i can see the screen easy right <laughs> and uh i'll talk to you guys all later all right. thank, thank you guys you. for having me on for sure oh thank you mike for being here ed of course thank you for joining us as always a huge thank you to all the moderators, members, lurkers, listeners, super chatters, and contributors. Of course, the replay crew and anybody else that just happened to stumble across this weird new intro into saltwater for the channel. I love you guys. We'll see you Thursday for Aquaholics Anonymous live stream. Until next time, keep your fish healthy, keep yourselves healthy, and don't be afraid to catch yourself a little fish room fever.